Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to the sanctuary. Looks like we got a new boat taking us to distant shores. So we must be heading into a new topic. Still going to be Professor C here. Still going to be doing A&P. And we're still going to be talking about muscles. But we need to get into naming some muscles. Specifically in this talk I want to tell you some tips and tricks for naming groups of muscles. So let's check it out. Alright, so... As we move into this next section where we're going to actually start giving names to muscles and groups of muscles, we have one big problem, and that is they are just so many muscles. If you can remember back from our bones talk, we had about 206 bones we went over. Each one had multiple parts, so it made it seem a lot more than that, maybe. Uh, but when we get into this concept of muscles, how many are there? There are about 600 or more, depending on how you count them. So to keep this simple, we need to keep a few things in mind here when we start our conversation on naming muscles. First, let's try to limit ourselves on the conversation. Let's try to limit it to skeletal muscle, like you see here on these two images in the left and the right side of the screen. When you do that, you reduce the number of muscles you have to learn by quite a bit. So we're going to try to cover, you know, about 95-ish, give or take, you know, when we're all done with our lectures that are coming up, 95 or so skeletal muscles. Um, good news for us too, most muscles don't have, you know, 15 different parts like some of the bones did, right? Think about the occipital bone and all the cracks and the holes and the lumps. We don't have that here. We just, you know, the name of the muscle is the name of the muscle. So many are grouped. Think about, say, hamstrings, right? Or quadriceps. And they're grouped by function, location, and how they attach themselves to the skeleton. So when you kind of learn one in the group, the others will be closely associated with it usually. Sometimes it's not, and you have to do some memorization. So the first thing we'll get into here is O-I-A-N. It's not a word. Uh, it stands for four different terms uh, that are often talked about when you're trying to learn muscle. It certainly helps if you know your bones. So my first recommendation is if you haven't studied any of the bones lectures yet, you might want to go ahead and do that because learning the muscles, some of them assume that you know the name of the bone. So O and I, let's deal with those first, the origin and the insertion. These are usually referred to as attachments, and I think we know how to spell that, but I'll just put it here just in case. You want to see it written out. Attachments, the origin and the insertion. Sometimes in pictures you just see it written as an O and an I. Now this is not always true. But in general, the origin of a muscle is the fixed position or the part of the structure that doesn't move. The insertion is the part of the muscle that is moved when it is pulled. Okay, often you'll see a joint in between the origin and insertion. So if I can draw something very simple like there's a bone and here's a joint and here's a bone, right? And you can say that's an arm and a forearm if you want to, but let's just keep it really, really simple here. Let's say we have a muscle, and I'll change the color just to get some muscular color or some orange. Let's say we have a muscle that goes from here to here, right? Now, I'm gonna say the origin is here, and the insertion is here. And what that means is, this is the fixed position that won't move, but when that muscle shortens, it will cause it to pull the bone where the insertion is toward it. And that type of action, where we're moving the insertion closer to the origin, uh, this is often called a flexion. And we'll get into the actions more in the next talk. Like its cousin, right? What if we did the opposite move? What if we switched the origin insertion and we did it the other way? We would have an extension, right? But we'll get into that again more in the next talk. Action, a word that I've probably used already, is makes common sense to most people. It's how the structures move through space, right? So I just gave an example of a flexion. That would be an action, and that would be a specific action in which the insertion moved toward the origin, and it did such in a when, as it decreased the angle between those two structures. That's called a flexion. If we were to extend the angle between the insertion and the origin, that would be an extension. Innervation is what the N stands for, and I know it's actually spelled with an I, 
but we use that O-I-A-N because it's easy to take notes with if you're trying to scribble very quickly as a professor speaks to you. So we're just talking about the nerve that powers that particular muscle or group of muscles, the innervation. What innervates the muscle? What provides the nervous system connection? Now again, if you know your bones and you know them really well, something very simple to do is to just look at a muscle, even though it might seem complicated at first when you see the name, just break it apart and think about where that might attach to the skeleton. So some muscles have their names based on their origins and insertions, and I've colored them here green and purple just so they stand out. So take, for example, this first muscle, sternocleidomastoid. If you've never heard it before, you may have no clue where it is or what it does. But if you can remember your attachments, your origins and your insertions, which one's movable, which one's not, you can start to picture in your mind what this muscle might do and where it's located. So sterno. Sterno sounds like the sternum, so I'm just going to very cheaply draw a sternum here, something like that. So clido, the word clido refers to the clavicle. So if I can kind of sketch out a clavicle here, I can do it like that. Now mastoid uh, refers to a part of the temporal bone, and if you, again, if you put your finger right behind your ear, you should be able to feel a lump of bone right back there. That's called a mastoid process. So what I want to do now is kind of draw a skull up here. There's a beautiful skull smiling at us. Hello, Mr. Skull. And then right back here behind the ear is a lump of bone called the mastoid process. So if we have a muscle, I'll again, I'll color it yellow just for example here, that runs from the sternum and the clavicle. Well, here's some on the clavicle. Here's some on the sternum. And then goes up here to the mastoid process somehow. You know, without knowing anything but the bone names, we can kind of see how this works. Well, those muscles are attached like that. And if the insertion is the mastoid process, it probably helps us, you know, shake our head. Yes, yes, yes. Right. It will pull our head down and let it pivot like that. So sometimes you can just name a bone based on its attachments. Another example, brachioradialis. It sounds like its origin is on the humerus brachio brachium for arm and the insertion is on the radius and so again this would be a perfect example of the first thing i drew where you'd have an elbow in between and you will be flexing and extending uh, the forearm now corico brachialis is another one that's named by its attachments looks like its origin now is on the coracoid process of the scapula and the insertion now is on the humerus. And this would help us move the humerus, but it wouldn't help us move the forearm technically. Okay, sometimes you can name muscles based on their number of origins. Sometimes they have two or three heads, as we call them. Uh, for example, remember the word for head. Uh, it could be sep, right? It could be cap, but sometimes in the muscles here you see it as sep or ceph and so how does that play into our numbers well biceps would mean two heads right or two origins and you can't just call the muscle in your arm the biceps because there's another biceps down in the leg triceps must have three heads or three origins and quadriceps as a group would have four heads or four origins a prime mover a prime mover is as it sounds like. It's the muscle that is going to give the major force on some specific action or movement. It can be called an agonist. Oftentimes when I'm doing notes very quickly or a lecture, I'll put PM next to a muscle to indicate that it is the prime mover for that particular action. And just like in literature, say you have an agonist, an agonist is the hero, there could be a villain right, that does things to oppose the agonist. This would be called the antagonist. So if a prime mover is providing the major force, an antagonist will oppose that particular motion. Synergy, being a synergist, is always the same. It's about adding power to some kind of a system. So very simply, synergists are usually smaller muscles that add force to a prime mover if need be. A fixator. Think about the word to fix in place, not to repair to fix, but to fix into place, like cement fixing and hardening. So this concept is this. A fixator is a synergist, usually a weak synergist, small, 
that functions to immobilize a bone, that is to hold it still, right, or a group of bones, to reduce motion. And that doesn't make sense usually when we talk about muscles. We think about muscles moving some bone, especially a skeletal muscle. But a fixator would act very much in the way that a tie-down works in the back of a pickup truck. You put the cargo in, you put the net on, and you strap it down so it doesn't move, right? And maybe it's an elastic net and it's got some tension in it. Uh, very similarly to the way, say, the rotator cuff muscles are arranged here. Again, we'll get into the details, but you've got subscapularis here. You've got teres minor back here. You've got supraspinatus up here and another one behind it we can't see. Lots of structures here holding this shoulder joint together. Uh, remember that shoulder, uh, the humerus inside of the glenoid cavity, has a lot of freedom of rotation and movement, and you don't want that to pop out of position. So we have some fixators there to hold that down, very much like a cargo net in the back of a truck. You could name muscles if you have a group together, like we have here, the abdominal muscles, uh, by how the fascicles are oriented in space. So relative to one another, how are the fascicles running? How are the fibers running? So a very simple, a rectus. Think about a rectangle, right? Right, right angle. Rect means right. It's running right with the body. And if I change to a white color, it'll probably help it stand out more. But right here, these muscles that I'm kind of sketching a line down, these are called rectus abdominis. That means they're abdominal muscles that run right up and down with the body. They would form your six pack or what is essentially an eight pack. Now, next to them right here, we see some fibers of the abdominal muscles that are running, you know, horizontally relative to the rectus. These are called transversus abdominis. Now, oblique means what it always means at an angle. So right here, I see some oblique abdominal muscles. And over here, I see them as well running at a diagonal to those other two orientations. Now you could get some geometry involved. We don't need to get too technical here. Let me change over to a red perhaps. So muscles and groups can be named based on, you know, who's bigger or who's smaller in the group, who's longer or who's shorter in the group, right? So terms like maximus and minimus, you probably heard of gluteus maximus. Well, there's also a gluteus minimus. They're both muscles we find in what we call the butt, but the minimal one would be smaller than the maximal one. We also have like a longus would be a long muscle in a group, say an adductor muscle, an adductor longus versus a brevis. And it's not called shortest. I know a lot of people want to try to say that on exam sometimes, longest and shortest, but it's longest and brevis from the word brief, right? To exhibit brevity, to be quick about it, to be short. So longus, long, brevis, short. Uh, Shape-wise, you could have something like, you know, deltoid. Deltoid is shaped like a delta, almost like the picture that's right behind it, right? This triangular structure. Deltoid would be a triangular muscle. A trapezius muscle would probably have a long side, a shorter side, and some kind of sloping angles like that to make a trapezoid. And a muscle named rhomboid or rhomboideus probably has... Well, in America, I think we teach this as being a parallelogram, but you could call that a rhomboid as well. That would be a rhomboid muscle or a rhomboideus. All right, hope you enjoyed some of those tips. Uh, we're going to work on some actions in the next talk, so join me for that one if you want to. Check out some more muscle videos if you want to get into it deeper. See you for the next one. Bye-bye.